Welcome everyone to a very special live episode of We Are Being Transformed. Um, here we explore the liminal spaces and contours of reality, the myriad of ways people interact with their world through the vehicles of ritual, cult, and lore. We have a very special guest this evening. I'm very excited to have him live. Um, his name is Dr. Edward J. Watts. Dr. Watts is a professor of history at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Watts is also the author of numerous seminal books on Roman history, including The Final Pagan Generation, The Mortal Republic, and the topic of our discussion this evening, The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, The History of a Dangerous Idea. So Dr. Watts, thank you for joining me. How are you? I'm great, thank you. So glad to be back. Welcome. So today we're gonna to talk about a topic that's very, um, prescient for not only history, but also for modern day. Um, we're going to talk about this concept of uh, people throughout the history of the Roman Empire using, utilizing the um, rhetoric of decline, fall to um, perhaps not always have the best interests of the people in mind. So uh, what struck me off the bat when reading the book was uh, this sentence from the book. Uh, ambitions, ambitious Romans often fashioned stories of decline so that they could build power for themselves by destroying present conditions. The Roman rhetoric of decline and renewal left a trail of victims across Roman history. This really captures the theme of uh, our discussion tonight and of the book. Uh, so I didn't know if you could further elaborate on this rhetoric of decline and renewal. Yeah, I think that the thing that is most striking in, in looking at Roman history is this is a almost a kind of intellectual um, contagion that has like infected all of Roman history and subsequent discussions of, of Rome, where um, people are always looking in Rome and, and past Rome at this idealized, um, glorious, golden past that never existed. Uh, and the idea in Rome for most of Roman history is that this is something that Rome has lost, it's fallen away from, and whatever it is that you imagine the glory of Rome once was, it's not there presently, uh, but frequently you have Romans who promise that they can bring it back. Um, and of course, it's a moving target that they're promising, right? The, the glorious past of Rome never actually existed in the form that they want. And they're presenting it in a way that um, allows them to create conditions for people in the Roman space to um, agree to do things they otherwise wouldn't do. So you create the sense of an emergency that Roman society is falling away from what once made it great. And it's, it's making um, changes that is weakening the structure of the Roman world and the structure of Roman tradition and the, the structures that govern Roman behavior. And it's an emergency. Uh, and we have to go back to what was once successful and only I can bring us back, but you have to give me power that you otherwise wouldn't allow someone to exercise um, because I am the only person who knows how to solve this particular problem and end this particular crisis. And uh, you see this over and over and over again across Roman history. Uh, so what inspired me to do this was um, reading the playwright Plautus, who gives us some of the very first fully intact works of Latin literature. And he's writing just after Rome has defeated Hannibal in the Punic Wars, right? The moment when everybody will look back and say, Rome was great then. And at that moment, there are people running around saying, we're in decline, we've lost our commitment to virtue. And Plautus is making fun of them because this rhetoric is so old, it's like boring. Um, it's, you know, it's the subject of mockery now. So if you start Roman literature with this being a kind of trite and overused trope by kind of old men yelling at people to get off their lawn, what what is the... Um, what is the impact of a society that is doing this over and over and over again, both on itself and then on subsequent, you know, subsequent generations of people who aren't Roman, but look back to Rome um, and see the same kind of rhetoric being useful in, you know, a contemporary context. Well said, thank you for that answer. And yeah, it sounds very familiar. That's all I'm gonna say for now. Uh, <laughs> um, but the book is really thorough. Uh, you cover you know, over 2200 years of Roman history uh, to the fall of Constantinople and even after, you know, just this idea of Rome even after in the later chapters um, being co-opted. 
we had a similar discussion with uh, a historical figure with Hypatia last time and just the idea of Rome, you know, being taken by, you know, fascist Italy, things like that. It's very, um, very fascinating. Uh, so for the sake of time, uh, we can only cover a few of these aspects of the Roman history, though. So I wanted to focus on these three situations. Um, the third century crisis, the invention of Christian progress under Constantine and the attempts of the Emperor Julian to reinvigorate imperial religious policies. These are respectively chapters 5, 6, and 7. So we often refer to Rome in the 3rd century as a time of crisis, right? So why is the reality, as the argument you make in your book, far more complicated? Uh, so one of the things that you see when you have this narrative of Rome always being in decline is uh, anytime that there are political upheavals, the easiest way that somebody who's overthrowing an existing government can create enthusiasm for a new government is to say that the existing government has failed in some fashion. Um, in the United States, you know, even when we have um, peaceful transfers of power, you look at the inaugural addresses when the uh, presidency switches parties, and there's always something is wrong, I'm going to fix it. I mean, it's, it, Trump did it, of course, but Obama did it and Biden did it as well. Um, and so it's a natural thing when government changes that you promise that you're going to do something to fix problems. The, the issue in um, the third century is that Roman government from the time of Augustus through the third, third century didn't change hands very often or very quickly. Um, the imperial office was something that you held for your lifetime. And so in moments of crisis, like in the year 68 and 69, um, in the, you know, the year around the year 193, um, you did have moments where there was all out civil war and a lot of people fighting with each other. But most of the time for, you know, for almost 300 years, um, Roman government was pretty stable and emperors died uh, and were replaced by somebody else. And generally speaking, um, emperors continued as part of a dynastic tradition where they didn't emphasize the failings of their predecessor because they owed their position to their predecessor. But starting in the year 235, you have 50 years where you have more than 50 people claiming imperial power. So between 235 and 284, you have more than on average an emperor a year across the Roman world. And every time these people take power, they do it in a way where they are um, justifying that, uh, that seizure of power by claiming that the people before them have done something terrible. And so if you read the narratives and you look at the coins and you look at the um, the things that these emperors use to describe what they're doing over and over and over again, they're talking about decline and they're talking about crisis and they're talking about problems in the Roman state. Um, and for um, a lot of that 50 years, you know, that decline is rhetorical. But there is a period in the middle of this, especially in the 250s and early 260s, where there are really serious problems in Rome. Um, where, you know, the empire is hit by a bunch of things, um, a plague, a set of military defeats, the loss of you know, multiple armies, the capture of an emperor, the killing of another emperor by barbarians. And so in the middle of the third century crisis is a real genuine crisis where the state really does look like it's falling apart. Um, but when historians talk about the third century crisis, we talk about it as 50 years. And the real sort of core worst part of that crisis is less than 15. The rest of it is the state trying to reconfigure itself, um, trying to create a way for, um, you know, for Rome to adapt to the challenges it's facing in the third century. Uh, but there's a whole lot of rhetoric about we're in a crisis, we're in a crisis, we're in a crisis, uh, because political power at the center is not stable. Um, but for much of that crisis, Rome is doing all right. You know, it is able to police its frontiers. It's able to collect taxes. It's able to do a lot of the things the state does. Uh, but the rhetoric looks terrible. Um, and so the third century crisis has this very serious crisis at its core. But then surrounding that very serious crisis is a whole lot of rhetoric of crisis and a lot less um, existential threat to the Roman state than, you know, we sometimes imagine. Yeah, absolutely. It really reminds me of... Um... In the modern day, you, you always have these uh, 
almost apocalyptic in a, I guess, secular sense, uh, people like saying that America is going downhill in terms of we need to get back to the good old days. Like say they look back to something like the fifties or whatever is like the ideal time. But um, I think just like in the Roman period, what they're doing is they're creating um, this kind of concept that wasn't existing in reality. It's just an idealized kind of version. You know, it's kind of like when you uh, listen to the radio and you listen to like uh, 80s hits, uh, you don't realize all the crap was that was on back then. Like, cause everybody <laughs> curates it, right? And it makes this idealized concept of, oh, things, the music was so much better in the 80s or 90s or whatever. So, you know, people kind of do that. Um, but getting back to the historical aspect of this. Yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. Uh, that That's what was eye-opening about, you know, this concept of crisis. Like you, if you're reading like these, um, text or, or these decrees and things like that it's always like it makes it seem very doom and gloom but like you were saying there's there's still these con these um real renewal i'm not talking about like rhetorical renewal um i was reading a book by um michelle salzman um mm -hmm. called the falls of rome and and she really emphasized um in her book that the senatorial um elites they really uh displayed uh, what, what she would call resilience. Um, yeah. So even though we have emperors, <laughs> you know, kind of coming and going, you know, the, these people are, um, these senatorial elites and others are rebuilding throughout the crisis. So very interesting. Um, yeah, that's a key part of what's going on in the third century. Um, there's a tremendous amount of local resilience um, so while the imperial government is struggling to do things like you know, determine who's going to be emperor, in the cities, uh, things are working. You know, the, the cities are capable of managing their finances. The cities are capable of putting on festivals. The cities are capable of, um, you know, managing trash collection and the sewers and the infrastructure. Uh, and sometimes even when the imperial government is not able to provide defense, the cities are able to rally citizen forces to come together and work with um, what imperial forces exist in the area and beat back invasions. So there's tremendous resilience in the Roman Empire in the third century that um, that, that big narrative of, oh, well, there's you know more than 50 emperors in 50 years totally misses. Yeah, absolutely. On 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 the micro level versus like what we see in like say a Western Civ one class, you know, makes it seem like it's almost like the Walking Dead at this point in time. But <laughs> but really, these on these localized levels, and just by the very fact that these senatorial classes were landowners, and they really held, they were the glue that held these provinces together. You know, just by virtue of the fact of the honor and shame, you know, kind of. Um, very competitive aspect of this Mediterranean world. So, um, and you know, the com competition for honor, for prestige, you know, so that really emphasized, um, or that really pushed them on to do these things. Um, but getting back to, you know, the third century and you were talking about, you know, things on the ground are, are working, but then you still have emperors being <laughs> chosen because there's so many coming and going. Uh, we finally get to Aurelian, right? Um, and Aurelian is somebody who I found really interesting uh, with his um, renewal and, and his rhetoric of renewal and the empire that emerges post 274 um, as we get into the, so what were the ultimate consequences of Aurelian's renewal um, and the empire that emerged post 274? Yeah, um, so the 250 is, as you said earlier, is a disaster. Um, you know, the state can't defend its borders. The state really can't uh, control the influx of invasions across uh, the frontier. The state, you know, can't deal with the effects of a plague. Um, in the 260s, what you see is instead of one centralized government, uh, you have the state effectively, the Roman state effectively break into three governments. So there's a, an emperor based in um, what's now like around Cologne in Germany who controls more or less um, Northwestern Europe. There's the central empire based, of course, in Rome. And then in the east, you have Zenobia um, and her son uh, running things out of the city of Palmyra. And um, in the 260s, Zenobia's husband, a guy named Odonathus, uh, actually took control of the entire Roman eastern frontier and won wars against the Persians, kind of using a combination of his resources and Roman resources. 
What Aurelian does is he inherits the middle part of the empire. And he decides, he inherits it in 270, and he decides that these local structures that had made Rome so resilient in the 260s are actually a problem because he wants, again, to have a unified Roman state with one person, of course, him, in charge. Uh, and so what he does in the first few years of his reign is he goes, he goes to the east, he destroys the power of Palmyra, he captures Zenobia, brings her to Rome, makes her marry a senator to symbolize the, you know, the integration again of the east into the empire. He goes into what's now France. He um, arranges for the the people running the Gallic Empire based in Cologne to um, to surrender to him. They come in. One is made a senator. One is made a governor. And again, you have this symbolic reintegration. Uh, and then what Aurelian does is he he starts cutting some of those local institutions that made localities resilient um, and made localities also able to better resist central administration. And so Aurelian's renewal is. Um, if you're looking at that that whole story of, well, there's so many emperors in so many years, what Aurelian represents is, is a paring down of some of the chaotic um, multiplicity of Roman imperial structures into, again, something that looks like one emperor who's all powerful, who's centered in Rome, who controls everything. Um, in practice, it's kind of a mixed bag, right? I mean, he does create like one imperial center with one guy in it. Um, and then he ends up getting assassinated and you're back into the the game of, okay, well, so who's going to be Chaos. emperor? Who's going to be emperor? Uh, and the, uh, you know, and the funny story about that is after he's assassinated, the um, army asks the Senate to appoint somebody. The Senate uh, refuses to do it. And for a few months, there isn't an emperor because the army is asking the Senate to do it. The Senate is saying, but then you guys are just going to overthrow this person. We're not going to do it. And for a few months, the only person appearing on coins is Aurelian's wife, because there is no emperor. So now you just have this, this vacuum where no one is totally comfortable with this vision that Aurelian created. You know, nobody is totally comfortable with the idea of like going back to an empire where one person is in charge. And it's not clear who decides this anymore. It's not clear whether it's the Senate or the army. Um, and so Aurelian's vision of renewal is... It, it's not really renewal so much as it's retrograde, like restoration of something that has passed its its sell by date. Um, and so, what you get for most of the rest of Roman history is not an empire run by one person, but an empire run by multiple people, because you it is too complicated to run as one person. Um, Absolutely. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no. So I, I think um, you know, I think that's that's in a way the consequence of Aurelian's renewal is it. It looks on paper like what he's done is he's you know begun to fix the third century crisis. In practice, what he's done is like gone back to a model that um, really passed its date like fifty years before, and it's clear the Roman Empire needs something different. Um, but again, like we are so, we struggle so much to understand what progress can mean in a context like the Roman state that is such a traditional structure um, that we fail to see that what Aurelian is doing is actually um, superficially a restoration. But in practice, he's creating um, significant problems that the Roman state is going to have to figure out how to deal with. Right. He kind of creates the situation where centralizing everything, it kind of makes you know, just the vast um, geographical area that the that Rome is at this time versus maybe the golden age he's looking back to. You know, it's it's not really something that is, like you said, wieldy or really efficient for the needs of that present moment in time. So, um, yeah, very no. very interesting. Rome's the size of the continent. It's it's basically the size of the continental United States. Um, that's the size of Aurelian's Roman Empire. And uh, you can't, and you have to run this, you know, from one central place uh, when you have like 60 million people to 80 million people living in it, and you don't have any communication tools that move faster than a person can move. Um, it's very hard to do. And when people across that state expect the state to do things for them, and they have to wait in the summer, you know, a month maybe to get a response to anything from the imperial court it's not really going to work. And in the winter, you might wait all winter. 
So, uh, you know, so the, the structure that Aurelian is trying to put in place is just not the structure that Romans needed in the 270s. Um, but it looks good because it looks traditional. Absolutely. And we will talk about the role that uh, the, the rhetoric of the panegyric, I believe, uh, plays in this kind of um, attempts to create the, the vision or at least the idea that, you know, there's progress occurring. Um, so you were we were talking just now about how vast this geographical area was, and I'm sh at the time I'm sure that this was very very clear to a man that you know a thing or two about uh, Diocletian. So <laughs> he creates the Tetrarchy, right? So um, as we get into the Tetrarchy um, and the rise of Constantine and his successors, this kind of harkens back and reminds me of our discussion we had on the final your book, The Final Pagan Generation. The world is vastly different at the beginning of the fourth century compared to where it ended, right? Um, so before we kind of get more into that, I didn't know if you could talk a little bit about Diocletian's restoral and renewal. Uh, what did this bring to the empire? How did the tetrarchs that emerged in the wake um, of all this differ from the emperors who came before? Um, we talked about Aurelian as, you know, kind of creating this retrograde aspect of, you know, one sole emperor, but um, the Tetrarchy is a completely different animal. So I didn't know if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think the Tetrarchy is the, the reasonable person's solution to the problem of how you run a Roman Empire, where the place is gigantic. Um, the structure that Augustus set up was really effectively a colonial structure where the place existed for Italians to exploit. And over time, more and more people across the empire um, became citizens and began to expect more from their government than just taking stuff from them. Um, the third century crisis in some ways is a crisis of uh, Rome scaling up to meet the needs of the citizen population that is now much bigger uh, and has much more, um, requires much more of the state. And so the 260s, when you had that splitting of, you know, a Gallic empire, a uh, Palmyrian empire, and then the central empire, uh, represented a moment where, you know, kind of by accident, Rome started paying more attention to the needs of people in its regions. Uh, when Aurelian destroyed those regional states, so those regional kind of Roman entities, um, the people in the Rhineland and the people in the Euphrates Valley and the people in Egypt and the people in um, Morocco, they really needed people who, they needed administrators who were going to respond to their needs. Uh, and what Diocletian recognized is one person can't do that and one person absolutely can't do that from, um, you know, from a central place in the city of Rome. And so Diocletian, uh, took power by winning the civil war, but then almost immediately, within a year, uh, appointed a, a colleague um, who was not a family member. And this was something that was relatively rare. The last time that you had an emperor appoint a colleague who was not a family member um, without any kind of pressure for him to do this uh, was the Emperor Hadrian like 150 years before that. So it was very, very rare for people to pick colleagues from outside of the immediate family uh, unless someone was forcing them to do it. No one was forcing Diocletian to do this. He did this because he saw that there was a need to um, provide military leadership and civilian leadership along the Rhine frontier and also pay attention to things going on in the East. Um, then a few years later, uh, they appointed junior emperors who served under the two senior emperors. And that's the Tetrarchy. Um, the Tetrarchy means rule of rule by four men. Uh, and so you had Diocletian and um, Maximian, who were the senior emperors, who were called the Augusti. And then you had two junior emperors, Galerius, who was based in the east, and Constantius, who was the father of Constantine the Great, who was based in the west. Uh, and each of them had a portfolio where they were in charge of a particular set of territories uh, that were then geographically divided so that somebody was close enough to everywhere that they could effectively deal with problems in that region. So um, Constantius was dealing with northern, you know, what's now northern France and Britain. Um, Maximian was based in Italy. Uh, Galerius was based in the Balkans. Diocletian was based in Asia Minor. And they each had responsibility for dealing with the problems in those particular regions. And it worked pretty well. 
Um, they also built out the military and the administrative infrastructure so that there were troops available in each of those regions so that each of the emperors had a field army that they could command. Uh, and also they had administrators who could make sure that the needs of the people in those regions were being conveyed to, um, to imperial authorities and imperial authorities had the capacity to respond efficiently. And so the Tetrarchy is in a sense that is a solution to this problem of scale that Aurelian totally didn't appreciate and didn't understand. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, Diocletian really seemed to appreciate the strategic need to have these co-administrators. Uh, before we get to our next question, I, I just wanted to point out, like, I really love that famous, uh, the statue of like all the four tetrarchs together and they're like, <laughs> they're like, they're indistinguishable, but like they're working together. And uh, I think you mentioned that, you know, as, or this is like a Roman historical thing, but like as, as time moves on, the um, the portrayals of the four are more individualized at the beginning, but then towards the end, it's kind of like uh, you can't really tell that much of of it apart because that's kind of the idea that they're trying to convey. You know, just yeah. this power. You know, um, I think what's based. so interesting about that is um, with Diocletian, you really do see this. You know, you see early portraits of Diocletian that are, I mean, they look like a person. They might not look like how Diocletian actually looked, but they look like a person. Um, as you move through this, they get completely indistinguishable. You know, the four tetrarchs look exactly the same. Um, when you look at the career of Constantine, who I know we'll talk about in a minute, but when, we, when you look at the career of Constantine, you have the opposite path, where he starts out with coins where Constantine looks like the tetrarchs, he's totally indistinguishable. By the end of his life, it's individualized, and um, he has a very distinctive, um, recognizable portrait. And so, you know, with the Tetrarchy, you really do see this sense that all of them are supposed to be working together um, indistinguishably. And so, yes, okay, if you believe that Diocletian is the most powerful and, and most important of the Tetrarchs, but you're living under Constantius, who's probably like, you know, the fourth of the four, it doesn't matter. They're the same, right? They, they exist in different bodies, maybe. They are different people, but they all speak with the same voice. Uh, and they all have the same authority to um, convey the power of imperial leadership. It's just, you know, you've got Constantius and that's who you've got, but uh, he doesn't speak with any less authority. Right. Unless you're a member of that person's private military, but <laughs> that does suck it. Uh, so before we get to Constantine, um, one thing that comes up again and again, whether it be, you know, the, uh, the Republic period of Rome versus now, or not now, but I mean, the Republic of period versus Republic period versus the time we're talking about now, uh, which is like third, fourth century. Um, there is a role that's very important played by oratory, panegyric. Um, these are in the declarations. This is propaganda for lack of a better term of restoration or renewal. We see it pop up again and again. So um, I didn't know if you could just talk about what this was, how it was utilized. Um, I know Julian very, very much, uh, when we get to him, he utilizes it in very playful, uh, condescending ways to Christian <laughs> uh, teachers he doesn't like. So I don't know if you could just talk about it a little bit. Yeah, so, um, so one of the things that is really, really important to the way that the Roman government works in the fourth, third, fourth century um, is that there's a lot of government. Uh, so one of the things Diocletian does to make the empire more efficient is he creates smaller provinces. And in these provinces, you have imperial governors and imperial officials who part of their job is to travel around the province and visit every city. Uh, and there's a ceremony when an important person comes into the city that involves them coming into the city. They then sit on a stage, the like local teacher rhetorician comes and gives a speech. The speech is uh, usually done, I mean, sometimes people drop the ball, but it's usually done by um, this, the orator sending something to whoever's coming saying like, what should I talk about? And they say, here's what you should talk about. <laughs> and then he crafts a speech that um, is a bunch of sort of platitudes and the, the talking points that he was given. Um, and so he is in essence dressing up for the local population the um, the kind of imperial propaganda that he's supposed to talk about. And it can be 
praising an emperor if an emperor is coming to town. It can be praising like, you know, the governor of Silesia if the governor of Silesia is coming to town. Um, and each of them is going to have something slightly different. But um, but the job of the panegyricist is to so, is to commemorate an occasion where something important is happening, someone important is coming to town, um, and to do it in a way that both communicates why that person is important, communicates why the town is important to the person, and then talks about what that person has done in a way that's meaningful to the audience that um, that they're speaking to. But it's such an important part of the rhythm of administrative life in the Roman Empire. Um, occasionally, you also will have like private performances of this, where you know somebody will come in uh, and they'll sit in a salon, and, and someone will you know give a, a speech praising them to you know a selected group of really important people in the town. Um, occasionally, you'll have people write the panegyric without an audience at all. Um, without the person present at all, they'll deliver it to their friends, they'll send it by mail, the person will pick it up. Um, but most of the time, what we have to understand is the panegyric is part of this ceremonial that brings people together as Romans to celebrate being part of the Roman Empire by being in the presence of someone who represents that empire. And the panegyric then um, commemorates that person, commemorates their place in the Roman Empire, and commemorates the role that the listeners have as subjects and citizens of that Roman state. And so it plays this um, this really important kind of community binding and bonding role uh, for people in the third and fourth centuries. And the vast majority of these panegyrics that were delivered, we don't have. But so many of them were delivered that we actually have a significant number from the fourth, third and fourth centuries, just because the quantity was so immense. Um, and so we have, you know, we have a bunch from um, Syria. We have a bunch from what's now France. We have you know, a bunch that were given in Constantinople. We have some that were given in Rome. Um, you know, we it's random that we have them in a sense, but um, it's not random that we have so many from that period because this was such a part of Roman life. Uh, and, and they're very carefully curated as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that goes hand in hand, probably. You're talking about, it shows where people are and, you know, where they belong in that society, right? So it's it's very much a part of identity building. Um, like if you're, it's, it's kind of like if you're um, in an association that kind of shows you and shows other people where you're at in the society, right? And where you belong on those social scales. So panegyric, yeah, is, is another kind of identity binding glue for lack of a better term and I just find it fascinating I love reading those because it's like so over the top at times um we also know that the people giving these use them as career advancement tools so um so we know for example that there's a guy who wants to be a teacher of rhetoric and he kind of shops around to try to figure out the city where he can do this and he he settles on um he thinks he can do it in, in um, Caesarea so he writes to the governor of, of the province of Palestine three, there's three Palestine provinces at this point. Um, and he says, effectively, I'll write a panegyric for you. Here's what I'm gonna say, like, let me just come down and you know, I'll deliver it. You don't have to give me anything, but it's understood, of course, if you like it, you will give me this position. And he goes, he gives a panegyric, the guy likes it and he gets a position, he gets a teaching position. It's kind of um, like the uh, the antique version of the seven day free trial, I guess. Uh... <laughs> exactly, yeah. And that was an amazing answer, Dr. Watts, as always. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to get back to the consequences of these changes that Diocletian made in making the Tetrarchy. Um, you mentioned because of the vast geographical area, these um, administrators had to be in certain strategic locations. This also meant, as a result, beefing up the military, right? So if you're beefing up the military, you're inevitably going to have these military men loyal to the person <laughs> that they're working under right it's like this person who's like you know under this military person here isn't going to care about constantius's you know stuff going on he, he just cares that he's getting paid because he's working under <laughs> one of the other tetrarchs right so um this kind of creates loyalty um conflicts eventually that will lead to the rise of figures like constantine so i wanted to get a little bit into him um yeah. Um, so I think the thing that um, Diocletian 
believed idealistically, um, but really shouldn't have. Um, Diocletian believed that imperial power was something that didn't belong to the emperor and it didn't belong to his family. It belonged to the Roman people. And um, the idea that it should be passed down through a sort of hereditary um, track where fathers give power to sons, Diocletian did not agree with. He also didn't agree that um, emperors should be in power for a lifetime. So Diocletian um, ended up resigning power after, well, in 305, after 20 years of reigning together alongside Maximian and retiring. <clears throat> and he retired to what's now the city of Split um, and refused to come back. Uh, and Maximian didn't really want to retire, but Diocletian told him he had to retire, so he retired. Constantius and Galerius then got promoted to full Augustus, and both um, Constantius and Maximian had sons who it seems at one point were being prepared to step in as the Caesars when Diocletian and Maximian retired. Uh, but some at some point, someone changed their mind. Uh, and it might have been the Emperor Galerius, it might have been Diocletian, it might have been um, some confusion. It's not totally clear, but when Constantius and Galerius are promoted, instead of Constantine and Maxentius being made Caesars, two other guys are. Uh, and this causes a real problem. Um, not immediately. Everybody is, is kind of on board with this immediately. But in uh, 306, a year after getting elevated, Constantius just dies in the city of York. So he's only full, you know, he's only Augustus senior emperor for a year. Uh, when he dies, uh, Constantine is there <laughs> with the army in Britain. And the problem, of course, with the um, distance that you have in the Roman Empire is things can happen on the ground before anybody else even knows about them. And so it's orchestrated that Constantine is proclaimed Augustus before anybody even knows Constantius is dead. And so uh, the news then comes out of Britain that Constantius is dead and Constantine is now his replacement. And this creates a set of negotiations where ultimately the other tetrarchs agree that, okay, yeah, it's fine. Constantine controls his father's army. We don't really wanna fight about this. It's not really a usurpation because frankly, nobody else had been appointed to um, replace Constantius. So, okay, fine, we'll just do this. Uh, as soon as Maxentius hears about this in Italy, he does the same thing. You know, he over he steals his father's army from, you know, his father's retired. The army supposedly belongs to somebody else, but they too knew Maxentius. They rally around Maxentius. Maxentius' father then goes and starts advising him. And then you have a real problem um, because there is a tetrarch who's supposed to be in charge of that army who now does now has been displaced and there are a series of civil wars. Um, and the, the long and short of it is the Tetrarchy ultimately falls apart because of this. Yeah, it falls apart. And uh, again, just getting back to uh, Michelle Salzman's book, um, you know, it's left, left to the senatorial <laughs> elites to kind of pick up the pieces there and keep things steady and going. Um, but it's also very interesting because Constantine, throughout these negotiations, he ultimately doesn't have power all at once, right? Like he's he's sharing the power that he's looking for little opportunities, right, to uh, to get more and more power. And then um, what he's yeah. doing is very interesting. He's he's using he's using the uh, allure of the senatorial. Um, titles and things like that to promote more and more people and create a bigger bureaucracy. It's very interesting and um, very yeah, interesting so what, he's using this. When Constantine um, decides the Tetrarchy is broken, he has the worst part of the empire. <laughs> you know, the, the four parts of the empire, um, the richest part is really the eastern part. Um, Italy and North Africa, which is the central part, um, that is also a very, very wealthy group of territories. Um, the Balkans, not as wealthy, but this is where the army does most of its recruiting. And Constantine has Britain and France and Germany and Spain, which in a modern context, you say, okay, well, that's got to be the best part of the empire. But in antiquity, that's like, that's the backwards, most backwards part of the Roman world. You know, these are places that are um, not really self-sustaining, uh, like they 
They do not have the ability really to maintain the functions of the state without resources being drawn from these richer parts of the empire. And so what Constantine realizes is first, the Tetrarchy is about, it's, it's falling apart. Uh, and second, if I don't do something, somebody else is just gonna roll me up. Uh, and so he decides to attack Maxentius because Maxentius controls Italy. Um, Italy is, is very wealthy. It is a, of course, the center of the empire because Rome is still you know, the center of the empire. Uh, and Maxentius is maintaining power illegally in the eyes of the other Tetrarchs. So attacking him is kind of fair game. You're not gonna risk a larger civil war with the other Tetrarchs if you attack Maxentius and you solidify your position. And so Constantine has a, um, a real incentive to attack Maxentius. The war is not easy. Maxentius has um, done a good job of fortifying the major cities in Italy and especially fortifying the city of Rome. Um, but when Constantine wins this, he has to do a lot of work very quickly to solidify his relationships with the Roman Senate. And this is what Michel so, shows so well, um, is that Constantine and the Senate both realize they need each other, uh, but they have to work out the terms under which they can work effectively with one another. Uh, and, and they're both very good at figuring out how to, how to have conversations that are frank and effective conversations about what does Constantine need from the Senate and what does the Senate need from Constantine to make arrangements so that they can continue to work together and trust each other and cooperate uh, in a fashion that's going to um, reinforce Constantine's position and enable him to ultimately fight, you know, further civil wars down the line. Yeah, I found it very interesting that uh, once he won the civil war with uh, Max Sanchez, he he um, he did some brutal stuff. Don't get me wrong, like parading the head around the city with, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you know tearing stuff down but he's also you know he's giving a lot of quarter um maybe more lenience than i gave him credit for initially um because i've always seen constantine as very you know uh hardened but um what he does with the senatorial elite is very yeah interesting like he's um giving you know pardoning certain people and he's marrying people into his family and and he's leaving you know he's leaving his mom and you know other members of his family in rome while he's gone so it's very um interesting the give and take that's happening there yeah um, i think um with constantine you have a figure who is very calculating um and very generally very good at deciding when to work with somebody and when to cut somebody off but he's also he's, he doesn't hesitate to be brutal but he isn't unnecessarily brutal either. You know, when he when he is brutal, he doesn't do it just to do it. He does it because he believes that it's the best option for him in that particular circumstance. Right. Yeah. He certainly does a more calculating job than his sons would later down the line. <laughs> um, getting back to kind of the rhetoric of the decline, the renewal, um, it takes on a very interesting change with Const Constantine's rise. Um, see the emergence of a Christian concept of restoration and renewal. It takes on almost a, a vastly biblical character. So I didn't know if you could uh, talk about this briefly. Yeah, so uh, with Constantine, Constantine has a bit of a problem because he converts to Christianity. Uh, and in a Roman context, these stories of renewal are always hearkening back to something Roman in the past that made Rome great. Uh, so, you know, right before Constantine's conversion, Diocletian um, and Galerius and the other Tetrarchs had launched the Great Persecution, the, the most comprehensive and um, most destructive Roman campaign against Christians in the entire history of the empire. Uh, and this was done in part because Diocletian feared that the progress that he'd made to restore Rome was being undercut by the fact that so many people were becoming Christian. Uh, and so this was, this was in a way, a traditionalist response to a condition in Rome where it seemed like through Christianity in particular, Rome was moving away from the religious traditions that had made it great. So Constantine's problem is Constantine genuinely believes that he won the Battle of Milvian Bridge and he won the war with Maxentius because of the Christian God. Um, he genuinely believes that his success came about because of his faith in Jesus and the Christian God. But there is no Roman tradition that says uh, emperors succeed because of the Christian God. Um, and so Constantine is, in a sense, looking to remake Roman society, not in a way that it was before, 
but in a way that it never had been before. Uh, and this is a challenge because Rome is a society that generally looks backwards to you know, see what has been done in the past and what has succeeded in the past. Uh, and when there's a crisis to return to the things that were done in the past, because clearly um, you have stepped away from what made Rome great. And what Constantine has to say is, he has to explain how it is that this new religion that is so new that it would actually it was actually founded during the reign of the Emperor Tiberius, right? It, it is younger than the Roman Republic. It's younger than the Roman state. It's younger than every religion that you know, that Romans accept as legitimate. Um, Constantine has to explain how this young religion actually will make Rome better than it has been before, certainly better than it is right now. And so Constantine um, falls back on this idea that actually um, monotheism and monotheism embodied in the Christian God is the original religion of humanity. And what's happened over time is people have gotten confused and they've misunderstood the, the, you know, the way that the one God, um, the one Christian God interacts with the world has, you know, they've seen different interactions and, and misattributed those interactions to individual gods when really it's just one God. And so over time, humanity has lost the sense of one supreme God directing everything. And what Constantine is doing is he's restoring that original human religion, that pure human religion. Um, and he's removing all of the, the sort of misunderstandings that have come about over, you know, over the years through different pagan traditions. Uh, and so Constantine, on one level, knows that he's arguing for something new, right? Christianity is new. But he's framing that argument as a very traditional argument in which he's saying, you know, yeah, OK, Christianity is new, but the worship of this God is very, very, very old. And so I am restoring the glory of Rome by restoring to humanity the worship of this one primeval supreme God that at one point we knew, but we've you know, come to forget. Now we can come back to it. And this will make Rome better than it has ever been before, because it's a restoration to something um, basic and fundamental and a kind of first principle of humanity that Rome has lost. But our return to it will make us better because we're never in Roman history have we been so purely in communion with this God. So Constantine won Celsus zero. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. Constantine uses this whole uh, post Hellenistic philosophical concept that gets taken from the Stoics and goes into middle and then later Neoplatonism and then uh, taken by Christians like Tatian, right? And then they're arguing essentially the same thing. You know, this is the oldest kind of wisdom religion. It just, it's gotten lost and corrupted through um, misunderstanding. So yeah, it's very interesting. Constantine does that on the imperial level. Um, he's yeah, kind I of think that um, there's, there's sound Christian backing for what he's doing. It's also sound politics. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think one of, one of the things we see with Constantine is <clears throat> he's um, his religious convictions. And here I know I'm I'm arguing with a lot of people when I say that Constantine's religious convictions, I think, are pretty clear um, and they're pretty pure. And he really is a Christian. Now, does he know what that means? And he's a Christian on his own terms, for sure. Um, what bishop is going to tell Constantine that what he's doing is not Christian? You know, I mean, nobody at that point. But, um, but Constantine really does genuinely believe that he's a Christian. Uh, at, at the same time, Constantine also acutely understands that there are real challenges in an empire that is probably 90% pagan um, to come out and too aggressively promote a religion that says in essence, 90% of Romans are wrong and can't do what they're doing. Um, and so Constantine has to find a middle ground. Uh, but rhetorically, I think he's very clear about what he believes. Um, and he is very clear about what he wants other people to believe. Um, so I, you know, I think with yeah, Constantine, I would agree. we see the politics uh, definitely playing into the discussion of religion. Um, interesting in the sense I used to really be on the. I think it's 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 very trendy bandwagon to go. Constantine didn't really believe 
didn't convert his deathbed. There's a whole conspiracy theory about that. Um, but um, you know, after reading more and more lately, after I've came uh, back to history, it's I'm I'm convinced he was a genuine believer. He was just uh, uh, kind of like if Pablo Escobar was a Pablo Escobar was a huge uh, <laughs> Christian, you know, just on his own terms, right? So you know, power is the most important thing. So. Um, so we see this uh, experiment, for lack of a better term, Christian experiment uh, continued through Constantine's successors, right, such as Constantius the um, first. But then you have this red herring, or not red herring, but you have this uh, curveball that's kind of thrown to Henry possibly uh, with uh, Julian, uh, known as the apostate, but we will call him the Emperor Julian because... Uh, you know, apostate is a derogatory term. Um, so Julian comes along uh, during a very volatile time in this Roman Empire, right? Uh, we talked about this before. Um, when we, when, when you, when you take a Western Civ class, uh, you're always like, oh, well, this is just the pro progress of history. But at this moment in time, you know, things could have been vastly different. Um, you know, um, it, it wasn't necessarily um, the case that Christianity was going to win out um so julian is different obviously from his uh relatives in uh in that he is uh hearkening back to a different kind of uh renewal so i didn't know if you could talk about his religious and political reforms for a bit yeah i think that um it's it's very interesting to step back in the fourth century and and remove from our minds this idea of how Christianization works. Um, we have an idea of how Christianization works that is based on a kind of linear understanding of what Christianity does and how it interacts with non-Christian religion that um, I think is, is influenced deeply by stuff like the Spanish Inquisition and the conversion of um, Native Americans and uh, you know, stories that have nothing to do with the Roman world that apply what were supposedly lessons from the Roman world but don't really have to do with the progression of things in the Roman world. And um, I think there are a series of decisions that are made by Constantine's successors in particular that make the story of Christ the Christianization of the Roman world one of a kind of linear progression where the state uses more and more power to restrict the traditional practices of paganism and push people towards being Christian. Um, that's not what Constantine actually did though. You know, what Constantine actually did was uh, make it very clear where he stood and provide inducements for people to convert to Christianity, but not compel people to convert to Christianity. And it's under Constantine's sons that you start getting the efforts to compel people. So under Constantine's son, Constantius II, um, for the first time you do have like closures of temples and prohibitions of people sacrificing in temples. Um, you have a first attempt to actually punish people for sacrificing. No one is actually punished. But it's the first time that you actually have legislation where they say you should be punished for sacrificing. And Julian is coming of age in this environment. So he's um, his father and most of the male relatives in his family were murdered by Constantius II to try to make um, the succession more easily um, tolerable to people and less contentious. Uh, Julian then is raised effectively as an orphan by um, Christian monks who teach him like theology. And Julian is very, very smart and his monks are, are very, very not. And so Julian uh, quickly kind of exceeds their ability to teach him. Uh, and he convinces Constantius to let him go to real school because he's understimulated and Constantius begins worrying that an understimulated Julian whose family he has murdered might become a problem. And so they send him to philosophical schools in Asia Minor, they send him to rhetorical schools in Athens, uh, and Julian secretly converts to paganism while he is in that environment. But you know, the, the thing about that that is so strange is for people devoted to traditional religion and people brought up in traditional religion, there's no such thing as converting to paganism. Paganism is not a thing. You know, it, religion is what you do, it's not what you believe. And they didn't see a necessary binary between traditional religion and Jesus. There were lots of people who would acknowledge, yeah, okay, yeah, you can worship Jesus and you can pray to Zeus and you can, you know, what, what's the problem there? And Christians are the ones who explain, well, no, there's a problem there. But for people who are devoted to traditional religion, that isn't a problem because to them, gods are things that you add in. They're not required, they don't require you to drop the gods you wish you've worshiped before to embrace a new God. 
And so when Julian converts to paganism, he's doing something that doesn't make a lot of sense in pagan terms. I mean, it makes a lot of sense in Christian terms. And those are the terms that Julian has internalized, but it doesn't make a lot of sense in pagan terms. And so Julian starts doing things as emperor um, that are designed to, in some cases, troll Christians. And he's very, very good at that. Um, and in other cases, uh, you know, undercut a lot of the institutional structures that Constantine and Constantius had put in place to encourage people to embrace the church. And then also um, he puts in things that replace those structures that encourage people to go to church with structures that are supposed to encourage people to practice paganism. Except again, this is Julian's binary, right? There's paganism and there's Christianity and Julian feels if you take from one and you give to the other, then paganism will, you know, will rise and Christianity will fall. And he doesn't understand that pagans don't work that way. And he doesn't understand yeah. paganism doesn't work that way. Uh, and so there's a big tension between what Julian, first of all, wants to do, what Julian thinks he's doing, and what's actually happening. Um, and the challenge we have is this would have been amazing because Julian took power when he was in his 30s. He's very young. Um, but he only lasts about 20 months. So we don't know the end of the story. Uh, you know, this could have worked. <laughs> it could have yeah. blown up in his face from the Christian side. It also could have blown up in his face from the pagan side. Yeah, it's, it, it, Julian, I was talking to Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Swist, who's writing a book on Julian right now. And uh, we talked about Julian as kind of like the first kind of... Uh, the hipster of the emperors he's he's like a he's like living in the first generation of the imperial christian regime right but he's looking back at this romanticized past it's kind of like i was telling jeremy i was like it's kind of like me when i was like growing up in the 90s but i was listening i was like looking back to the cure and like bauhaus and depeche mode and i'm like oh that's the stuff that was really good back then so i kind of became a hipster in that sense i'm like oh this is all this stuff that's really cool and all this 90s <laughs> stuff is garbage and you know it's the same thing julian's kind of like looking back to a very romanticized uh concept of paganism um but like you said it's very interesting um and i i i'm sorry to keep bringing this up but her books are so good but uh uh salzman and her book the making of the C uh, christian aristocracy and your book on um um you know paideia in terms of like city and school and antiquity it really emphasized that for these elites like it's not so much what you believe in the theological stuff it's practice right it's cult it's yeah. it's ritual it's 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 centralized things that um pragmatically hold you together in terms of you know paideia education things like that that bind you as an elite what you believe technically in terms of all that other stuff is secondary right almost in a way um, yeah but for julian it's, just, it's central that's the thing yeah, that's, like, yeah, that, exactly. that's the thing that's such a challenge for julian is for him, like the reason that he believes there's a system that holds all of traditional religion together is because of belief. And, you know, and, and that's because he believes, you know, because he has this very strong sense of what's true and what's proper. And, um, you know, and in a sense that again is his Christian worldview going through the, the prism and creating something that you can only get if you've had the experience Julian has had. It's not, normally what someone raised in traditional religion thinks about. Um, I mean, do they believe? I think they do. Do they believe in the way Julian thinks they should? No, it, because they don't understand the parameters Julian is setting. Well said. Yeah, it's um, just, we could talk about Julian all day and I have talked <laughs> about Julian all day with others. Um, maybe we'll talk to Dr. Watts about Julian someday, just to, uh, in terms of, you know, everything he did, everything from, you know, his Neoplatonic, um, philosophers, his all-star basketball team of Neoplatonic philosophers, to, <laughs> um, his trolling of Prohiresius, um, just amazing, amazing stuff. Um, but yeah, ultimately what we're trying to convey here is that the past Julian is hoping to revive, revitalize by his rhetoric, um, kind of like Aurelian, kind of like um, many other people in the, in the past of Rome's history, they're hearkening back to um, something that didn't necessarily exist it's kind of like a rose colored glasses mixtape compilation of you know the way things were back then the good old days so um ultimately what happens with julian is um his reign is cut short as you were saying um he's on a persian campaign in 363 um 
and then he gets, uh, I believe, he gets shot by the Persians uh, who are, you know, kind of showing him who's boss. And then um, I believe his successor just kind of like negotiates that part and says, okay, you let us go home and you could have this. <laughs> uh, I can't remember that story. Yeah, it's uh, so Julian's death is, is as they say, controversial. Um, <laughs> apparently, so he dies apparently outside of Fallujah, um, which we all, you know, we all know from recent past experiences. Uh, and he does it because he gets into a battle and doesn't wear his breastplate. And so there are Christian sources that say he was stabbed by a Christian. There are, of course, a lot of sources that say he was wounded by a Persian. Um, but the the long and short of it is um, Julian had made a series of decisions in the course of that campaign that meant that the retreat from, Persian, from Persia was really difficult. Um, he had, for example, burned his boats that you know were supplying him down the Euphrates, and so he didn't have supply lines. Uh, and so it was a very, very difficult retreat. And then when Julian is killed, um, it creates even more of a challenge about you know who's going to run things while we get out of here. And his successor Jovian does negotiate a peace treaty that gives up a significant amount of land. Um, because we don't know that area as well as we know Western Europe, we don't really understand sometimes how significant it is. But it would be the equivalent of um, taking the Rhine frontier and moving it into kind of northern France. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a really big issue. It's a really big problem for what, um, you know, for, for Jovian that he's made that peace treaty. And then Jovian has the, the wonderful good luck to um, go to, uh, on his way back to Constantinople, uh, to stay in this small town uh, and um, they paint the house that he's staying in the day before he gets there and it's airtight. And so he stays in there uh, and dies. Wow. The best, he has the best of luck. Um, that is a wild story. Yeah. Just all, all these, all these uh, later stories and the Magister Militums and, and all the, the consequences of growing the army to this size just fascinating to me um but um ultimately what happens with julian's death is uh, you have a series of what ifs um at this point um his experiments have failed but i think as you mentioned in some of your other books his policies don't exactly get overturned right away in certain areas like you look at the example of a place like alexandria right um where hypatia is living right and you see these christians and pagans kind of living um kind of side by side learning together right um so it's very interesting um but ultimately things do become christian right so um ultimately we know what happens there so yeah no i think um what we get with julian is a um a set of reforms and a set of ideas that uh in some ways are justifiable. You know, his, his um, laws about teaching, the first part of those laws are quite justifiable, right? We don't want, he, you know, he has a two-part law on teaching. The first is that all teachers have to have good character. The second part then is people who have good character can't lie. And therefore people who are Christian can't teach about pagan things because they're lying if they do it, because they don't believe it's true. The first law, everybody can say, yeah, okay, uh, we accept that really we don't want teachers of bad character teaching our children. Um, and we accept that there should be sort of a central way of um, deciding whether somebody is, is of good character and qualified to teach because we don't want um, people who like are violent or people who are predators or people who are um, unqualified. The second part, everybody, pagan and Christian alike, don't, they don't like that. And so the law that comes out uh, the law after Julian's death that is allowed to stand is the law that says you must have good character to teach. The um, law that goes away is the law that says that having good character means you have to be pagan uh, and teach only pagan things in a way that conveys that you believe it to be true. Thank you for that. Well said. Yeah, I was just bringing up um, the chapter where we discuss where you discuss this um, in your book. Um, yeah, very, very fascinating topics. Um, this was from chapter seven. 
that we're discussing, just in case anybody in the audience wants a quick reference if they want to go get the book. Um, I think what I wanted to touch upon for these last couple of questions is a bigger idea that you convey in your text um, or your book. Um, the point that you make is that we often overlook, we often look to Rome for lessons um, and stories of Rome's decline that leave out the people who Rome's renewal uh, victimized. Uh, I found this very, very powerful. So I didn't know if you could um, touch upon this a bit. Yeah, uh, in all of these cases where you see someone talking about a restoration of Rome or Roman renewal where something radical is happening, um, there are people on the other side of that, right? There are laws and traditions and customs that are designed to protect the rights of people living in this Roman state. And when people say it's such an emergency that I need to, uh, you know, I, I need to go around those laws or we need to avoid those laws or we need to ignore those laws, that means they're going to do something that should not be tolerated and normally would not be tolerated to somebody else. And sometimes you might say, okay, well, that's an emperor and he's a bad emperor and he's done bad things. And so, you know, if they're going to kill him, that's not a big problem for me. Uh, there's actually a speech that Julius Caesar gives um, when they are talking about doing this in response to the um, attempted coup of Catiline in 63 BC. And what Caesar says is, okay, you know, and, you know, we had this argument 20 years before where Sulla, the dictator, claimed that he was going to take action against people who did bad things in the previous, you know, previous phase of a civil war. And everybody said, well, that's great because these are bad people. And Caesar said, and then we noticed that it's not, it starts with the bad people and it just sort of works its way down. And soon it's affecting everybody. And soon the people who are losing their property or the people who are losing their lives or the people who are losing their, you know, their marriages, um, they're not bad people. They're just regular people. And the rhetoric of decline and renewal is always designed to create an emergency. So something that normally wouldn't happen becomes tolerable. Uh, and in Roman history, again and again, you see that that rhetoric that starts as something terrible is going on and we need to take really radical measures to fix it. Always there's somebody on the other side of it. And most of the time, um, if that renewal works out, Romans don't talk anymore about the someone who is on the other side of that. Um, they don't talk about what happened to them. They don't talk about the consequences and they don't talk about the long-term damage that's done to their society when you allow things like that to happen. Um, yeah, absolutely. And so that was the goal of the book is to say, every time you see this in a Roman context, there's somebody on the other side. You know, every time a Roman politician says, we've descended from our, you know, from our status that had made us great, and because we have descended from this, we need to do something really quickly to fix it. There's always somebody who is going to lose something on the other side. And most of the time, our sources don't even talk about them anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And it's very uh, prescient that you say that, especially this week, uh, with it being um, the week of mem um, remembrance. You know, we're, we're, we need to remember that there are consequences to this rhetoric. Rhetoric words do have power. Um, creates marginalization for you know other people and uh when we study history we, we focus a lot on the macro versus the micro what's going on on the you know maybe the magnifying glass aspect of the world and we don't realize that these are flesh and blood people that are being affected by this it's not just some grand panegyric right <laughs> it's a yeah exactly you know, people people lose their lives um People get marginalized. People get uh, their voices silenced. So we need to really fight really hard to uh, recognize that where we yeah, can. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a video game where the bodies just disappear and you can forget about them. Um, yeah, we're not playing. These Call are real people here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well said, Doctor Watts. Yeah, it's very important to remember that. Um, I have one more question. If you have time. Yeah. Perfect. So. I think this is probably my most um, important question, um, and it's really an, um, an important part of the book. Um, what can we take away from these stories of decline and renewal? What paths do we have to choose from, and what are the consequences for our society um, looking back at Rome for answers, so to speak? 
Yeah, I think um, the thing that we can take away from these long stories of decline and renewal uh, is sometimes decline is real. Sometimes it's not. And sometimes it's real, but not in the way that people are telling us. Uh, and the thing that we have to be critical about when we hear someone evoking this idea of we're in decline, it's an emergency, we must do something radical to fix it. We have to step back and first of all, identify who's on the other side of that, right? Who is gonna be the victim if we do this? Um, is this a fair, is this a fair classification of what's happening? And is there a different way to solve this problem? Because uh, in Roman history, a lot of times, like in the aftermath of the Second Punic War, there isn't decline, right? That Roman politicians are talking about this because they know that things are changing radically. They're changing radically in a way that is increasing um, economic growth. It's increasing resources availability. Um, it's changing a lot of Roman life very quickly, but a lot of those changes are good. But people feel uncomfortable. Uh, and so what you have when someone like Cato the Elder is talking about Roman decline in the 190s, is somebody speaking to discomfort, saying that you're right to be uncomfortable because what's actually happening is bad. Um, you can step back and say objectively, well, yes, it's uncomfortable because change is uncomfortable, uh, but it's not necessarily bad that Rome is becoming a bigger city. It's becoming a wealthier city. Immigrants are coming because they wanna work in Rome. You know, yes, these things are different. It doesn't mean they're bad. Uh, at other points, when you have, for example, Cicero talking about the decline of the Roman Republic in the 50s BC, yeah, things are bad. Um, what he's talking about is real. Uh, the solutions he's proposing are a little shady. Um, Cicero at moments is saying things like, yes, you know, there's a lot of violence in the state. And effectively, the people I don't like, um, yes, violence can be used against them because they're so dangerous, there's no other way to keep them down. But God forbid they should use violence against people I do like, because that's a sign of decline. And you look at that and you say, yeah, okay, there's a problem here. You're diagnosing a problem that is real, but your solution is crazy. You know, your solution is basically, yes, there's a problem with violence. So the only people who should use violence are people that I like, and they should be used against people. It should be used against people I don't like. That's, you know, identifying a real problem, but not actually identifying a solution. Um, and then the, the counter to that are moments where you have Roman officials who identify a real problem and identify a real solution, and the solution makes sense. So, you know, when the Antonine Plague hits the empire in the 160s and 170s, um, maybe as many as 20% of the Roman population dies. Uh, you have whole areas of the, the Italian peninsula that are depopulated. And what Marcus Aurelius does is he uh, creates mechanisms so that everybody who's still around can come together and come up with ways to collectively um, lend their talents in whatever way their talents are best applied to solve whatever problem they can best apply those talents to solve. And um, he brings in new people into the Roman state to settle on those new lands. Um, and in general, what you have there is an identification of a problem. It is a real problem and an identification of solutions that actually solve the problem without victimizing anybody. So, you know, you don't kill people or blame people or requisition the property of people because you feel like they caused the plague. The plague happened. You figure out how to solve it. You empower people to solve it. And you reward people who do a good job without punishing people who you don't like or who you feel didn't do a good job. Um, and I think that's the lesson that we can take away, right? Decline sometimes is not existing at all when people talk about it. Sometimes it really is existing. Um, but why are they proposing the solutions they're proposing? Are they using decline that is real to do something um, that they would that they want to do, not because it, it solves the problem, but just because they want to do it? Or are they genuinely trying to solve the problem? Um, and I think that this is the way that it can help us in a modern context um, consider the things that we hear and the solutions that are proposed. Because yeah, there are definitely things in our society that are getting worse. Um, and yeah, we are right to put our finger on some of those things. But not everything that somebody says is a problem actually is a problem. And not every solution to a real problem is actually a serious um, and objective way to approach that problem. And so what Rome shows us is, you know, we have to be very discerning when people are talking about issues in our society, both about whether the issue is real 
and about whether the solution is self-serving or really designed to correct an issue that absolutely needs attention um, and needs to be fixed. Uh, and I think Rome gives us tools so that we can make those decisions. Well said. Thank you for that answer. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add there is um, you know, it's very important to look at these um, not always mistakes, but decisions from the past and uh, realize that we must, at the end of the day, always be um, mindful of who is going to be marginalized or victimized by the decisions we make. So it's very important to always be a voice for the voiceless, as my uh, hero Oscar Romero said. Um, so I hope everybody will um, check out Dr. Watts's book, um, make the best decisions you can and take what you can. So Dr. Watts, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this time to you to promote whatever you'd like to promote. Um, I'm going to bring up your books and your YouTube channel and uh, just feel free to plug plug away. Great. Well, um, I, I appreciate this. I, I definitely am excited. Um, the YouTube channel, I'm working on a, a new set of things where we're going to do some shorts about the interesting things um, that my research is turning up. Uh, right now, I'm writing an, a history of the entire Roman state from the beginning to the end. Uh, and so there's lots of cool stuff that I'm finding that won't make the book, but I'm going to do little things about that. Um, I think in the next few days, I'm actually going to do a video about the uh, accession of Didius Julianus. And um, we will walk the imperial ramp that he took when he walked from the Senate into the imperial palace for the first time and nice. we'll talk about his experience doing it. So uh, so that's on the YouTube channel that will be um, coming up soon, hopefully. And then uh, the Eternal Decline and Fall is the most recent book, but also um, Mortal Republic is a book that talks about some of the political dynamics that we've um, explored here. And then the final pagan generation uh, will give you some more deep dive into the fourth century things that we've discussed. Um, but yeah. Uh, I look forward to coming back when the big book is done and we can talk about anything between, you know, the Bronze Age and uh, gunpowder and the fall of Constantinople in 1453. I love that. Yeah, I would actually love to have you back before that to talk about uh, the mortal, mortal republic. Um, I'm kind of getting out of my comfort zone with like I remember we were talking <laughs> about how I, I'm not I'm not very comfortable in the Republic era. So I try to stay away from that. So um, I think I wanted to you know, kind of go over the mortal, mortal republic with you because, like, like this book, there are lots of very important um, lessons that can be learned from this period of time in Roman history. Um, it's very uh, West Coast, East Coast back then for a lot, <laughs> a lot of these, uh, a lot of these senators. So, um, hopefully, we could talk about that, Doctor Watts. As always, this has been an honor. It's been amazing. Um, hearing you talk the lore of these uh, sometimes insane Roman emperors and <laughs> times. Um, hope to have you back. Um, you have a pleasant evening. You too. And, this was uh, great. And uh, I love I'll come back anytime. Awesome. And, and before we go, I just want to thank, as always, um, anybody who's watching, whether it be now, whether it be the replay, whether it be five years from now, um, very encouraged. The channel this month uh, will be four months old. Uh, we almost have 650 subscribers, which is not bad for a new channel. Um, I really appreciate each and every one of you, whether there was three of you subscribing or the 640 that we have now. I I really do appreciate each and every one of you. Um, this really encourages me to um, do this. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you to Graham. Thank you to uh, Carrie. Uh, you guys were the first <laughs> to really watch these and it, it's it's more important that you than you would think so i appreciate each and every one of you um until next time um always be a voice of the voiceless always learn from history to do better and uh we will see you on thursday with dan Trell from the modern hermeticist to talk about medieval and renaissance hermet hermeticism so until then have a great night